Okay, everyone. Shabbat shalom. <laughs> We're continuing the book of Job. And I remember you know, throughout this week and last week when people found out that we were doing Job, I had so much good feedback. They were like, yes, book of Job. Be like, and it's really interesting because it's not just been the local community, it's been people from the wider community internationally. Like people have either just come out of reading the book of Job or they've been wanting to. And it, I think it was timely anyway, but then to get the response that I did from everyone, I was like, that's really neat. It's one of them little God winks, you know, where like, like love it. Um, so last week we kind of did more introductory stuff, you know, we, we made uh, the, we, we said that Job could have possibly been actually from the lineage of Esau, uh, a few generations down. Um, I did a bit more uh, working out of the times, and from what I can see, if that's the case, I believe it's in the time um, before the Torah was given, before the Exodus, but after the birth of the sons of Israel, if that makes sense, the 12 sons, that's the time frame that you're dealing with, um, I personally believe. Um, now, last week we made, well, I made some fairly bold statements about the book of Job, and I said that as we go through the series, those statements will start to make more and more sense. So one of the statements I made was, um, Job was righteous in his deeds, he was righteous with his lips, but there was something that needed to be worked out in his heart, under the surface of everything. Um, that was one of the statements I made. Um, we also made the statement that, it wasn't just Job being tested. We saw his wife being tested. Um, and I made the statement that, are we going to see his friends being tested? Anyway, so last week we saw the calamities of Job, the two siftings that occurred. We saw his two friends come on the scene. Um, and we did, where we got to was where they sat with him to comfort him. Like they sat with him seven days, not saying a word because the pain was so great. So Job three, after this, Job opened his mouth and cursed the day of his birth. <laughs> and Job spoke and said, let the day perish on which I was born and the night it was said, a male child has been conceived. Let that day be darkness. Let not Eloah or God um, from above seek for it, nor let light shine on it. Let darkness and the shadow of death buy it back and let a cloud dwell on it. Let all the, that blackens the day frighten it. So I want to come right off and say, I'll ask the question actually, is Job talking about birthdays? No. Because people will use this first, like, ah, oh, birthdays, you know, Job cursed the day. Why did Job curse the day he was born? If he wasn't born, he wouldn't be suffering. And we're going to see this laid out as we go through. But look, in Job's 1 and 2, Job lost everything, absolutely everything. He lost uh, seven sons, three daughters, all the cattle. He lost the house. Now he's lost his health. He's having a bit more than just a bad day, okay? And you can understand, okay? So I just, it's just people will use this. Now, I don't want to get into a discussion of birthdays, yes, birthdays, no. That's for you, that's a separate discussion for you guys to work out. But you don't get to use this because you're pulling this out of context if you are. Um, let's keep going. And this will become evident as we go through. That night, let darkness seize it. Let it not be included in the days of the year. Let it not come into the number of the months. Look, let that night be silent. Let no singing come into it. Let those curse it who curse the day, who are ready to stir up Leviathan. Let the stars of its twilight be dark. Let it wait for light, but have none. And let it not see the eyelashes of the dawn. One thing you will start to see through the book of Job is that there's a lot of poetry. It's very, um, like in the Hebrew, you get this kind of rhythmical feel and you get a lot of Hebrew wordplay. Uh, you get some rhymes in there. Um, this is another reason why people think that Job was very well educated. He would have had to be to be a judge, 
we, we made the case that, well, he says he was a judge at the city gates. But this is a highly educated man. For I did not shut up the doors of my mother's womb, nor hide trouble from my eyes. Why did I not die from the womb, come forth from the belly, and expire? Why were there knees to receive me, or breasts for me to suck? So Job is basically saying, I wish I'd never been born, in a very eloquent kind of way, the most eloquent way possible. Um, now, this is where I believe you start to see, remember I said we're going to start to see heart issues with Job. I believe this is where you're seeing a little bit of double-mindedness at best, maybe hypocrisy at worst. Why do I say that? Literally the previous chapter, Job says, this is when his wife says, do you still hold fast to your integrity? Curse Elohim and die, okay? But he said to her, you speak as one of the foolish women speaks. Indeed, should we not accept only the good from Elohim and not accept evil? And all the, in all this, Job did not sin with his lips. Do you see a, a, dis, a, a difference here? He says in the previous chapter, should we only accept good? Yet evil has come upon him and he wishes he'd never been born. Which means, now, we know that in Job 2 verse 10, Job did not sin with his lips. So that means that he meant what he said. Remember what I said that we underestimate the effect that our fallen nature has on us and that uh, there's things that our fallen nature will make us do things without us even being conscious of it. And I believe this is what you're seeing because Job didn't sin with his lips, which is an overflow of his heart. But yet now that there's been trial tribulation and now that he's struggling in the flesh, he's saying, I wish I'd never been born which is where he needs to remember his own words. Do we see maybe a bit of, not hypocrisy, it's not full-blown hypocrisy, but it's almost double-mindedness. Let's keep going. This kind of language is paralleled by Jeremiah. Now, by looking at the example of Jeremiah, we can get a better understanding of what was going on in Job. And I believe that I'm going to come out right out and say it. I believe you're seeing the, the, the struggle between the flesh and the spirit within man. We all, you know, Paul says that the flesh wrestles against the spirit. I do the things I don't want to do and I don't do the things I ought to. There's this battle. And I believe this is what we're seeing with Job. He knows certain things, but his flesh is still struggling to, to deal with these things. And this becomes more evidently clear with Jeremiah. You're going to see this whole language again of cursing the day of being born come up again. Woe to me, my mother, that you have borne me, a man of strife and a man of contention to all the earth. I have neither lent for interest, nor have men lent to me for interest. All of them are reviling me. Do we see a parallel to Job here? Job says, I did, I'm righteous. I didn't do anything wrong. In fact, we're going to see his friends in the next few parts of this series, they were reviling Job, like really badly actually. You yourself know, O oh Yah, remember me and visit me and take vengeance for me on those who persecute me. So he's leaving vengeance to whom it belongs. He's not taking matters into his own hands. In your patience, do not take me away. Know that for you, I have suffered reproach. So he's putting his case before Elohim which is something similar that you're going to see with Job. Like Job will say, I want to bring my case before Elohim. What have I done wrong that all of this comes upon me? Your words were found and I ate them. Your word was to me the joy and rejoicing of my heart. For your name is called on me, O Yar Elohim of hosts. I have not sat in the company of mockers, nor do I exult. I have sat alone because of your hand, for you have filled me with displeasure. Why is my pain without end and my wound incurable, which refuses to be healed? Why are you to me like a failing stream, as water's not steadfast? So he's, he's, who's he aiming that at? Yeah. To Yah. He's having, you know, why are you a failing stream to me? Which implies intermittent water. So there's, it flows one minute, it doesn't the next. This is how Jeremiah feels. Therefore, thus said Yah to Jeremiah, if you turn back, 
So like the word there is shuv, which is where you get the word teshuvah from, repentance. So if you turn back, then I shall bring you back. Before me, you shall stand. So think of this as Jeremiah, I know I've called you out to be a prophet, but you're still going to stand before me in judgment. And you need to turn back to me. And if you take out the precious from the worthless, you shall become as my mouth, i.e. this is the role of a prophet, to be the mouth of Elohim. Let them return to you, but do not return to them, which is really interesting. He's telling you essentially how we are to be with our faith. If people want to come to you, that's one thing. Be a mouth to them, be a light, but do not return to them. But notice that Yah is holding Jeremiah accountable. He's not having a go at the people. The people are already being judged. They're going into captivity. But he's holding Jeremiah accountable, even though he's his mouthpiece. I find that interesting. And I shall make you to this people a strong bronze wall, and they shall fight against you, but not overcome you. For I am with you to save you and deliver you, declares Yah. So Yah's telling Jeremiah, you're going to go through stuff. And I shall deliver you from the hand of evildoers, and I shall ransom you from the grip of the ruthless. Now, what's really interesting, we read this, or imagine you're being persecuted, and Yah gives you this as a word, as a message. You're going to think, brilliant, I'm going to get away from it all. It doesn't say that. Like, why do I say that? Because one has to be in the hands of the wicked to be delivered and ransomed from them. Does that make sense? He says, I will deliver you from there, which means you're already in their hands. Now, you can understand like, why Jeremiah would ex uh, experience frustration with Elohim, because he's been told, they'll fight against you, but they won't overcome you, I'll deliver you. Well, we know Jeremiah's story, thrown into a pit, dragged off down to Egypt against his, uh, against his wishes, uh, someone plotted to take his life, like, on and on and on and on. It doesn't, it doesn't, deliverance didn't look as to how you would want it. Right, does that make sense? But Jeremiah did have his life. He was protected wherever he went, even though he endured a lot. He endured a lot. Let's keep going with this, because you get this language elsewhere. Now, we're going to read a good chunk of this chapter, uh, for context. And Pashchur, son of Imer, the priest who was also the chief governor in the house of Yah, heard that Jeremiah prophesied these words. Uh, so Jeremiah in chapter 19 has just pronounced judgment, basically, captivity from Babylon. And Pashchur struck Jeremiah the prophet and put him in the stocks that were in the high gate of Benjamin, which was by the house of Yah. So he's being publicly shamed here. And it came to be on the next day that Pashchur brought Jeremiah out of the stocks. And Jeremiah said to him, Yah has not called your name Pashchur, but Magor Misaviv. Now, this, you, to understand what's being said here, Pashchur actually means freedom or liberation in Hebrew. Now, what Jeremiah is calling him, Magor Misaviv, means terror on every side or terror all around. Because he's just prophesied that Babylon's going to come. Remember that the, the prophets back then were prophesying peace, peace. It, everything's going to be great. And Jeremiah is going up against the grain. For thus said Yah, see I am making you a fear to yourself and to all your loved ones. And they shall fall by the sword of their enemies while your eyes see it. And I shall give all Yehudah into the hand of the sovereign of Babel, so Babylon. And he shall exile them to Babel and strike them with the sword. And I shall give all the wealth of this city and its labor and all its valuables and the treasures of the sovereigns of Yehudah. I give them into the hand of their enemies who shall plunder them, seize them, and shall bring them to Bavel. So again, in stark contrast to what the false prophets were prophesying. And you, Pashchur, and all who dwell in your house shall go into captivity and enter into Bavel, into Babylon. There you shall die and be buried there, you and your loved ones to whom you have prophesied falsehood. Now, here it's okay. Oh, yeah, you enticed me and I was enticed. You are stronger than I and have, I, and have prevailed. I have been ridiculed all day long. Everyone mocks me. If you look at some of the other translations of this verse, it says, you have deceived me and I was deceived. And this is the... 
the, you know, it's a source of debate for a, a lot of chat from the scholarship, but it can mean entice, it can mean deceive, but it can also mean to convince someone. Like to, just like you give someone and you try and convince them. Let me ask this, did Jeremiah want to be a prophet? No. no. He said, I'm too young, and he knew. Like, you've got to remember, there were prophets that had gone before him, and he would have seen what happened to them. Now, Yah said to him, look, Jeremiah, I've called you from before the foundations of the earth. Uh, I knew you before, you know, before I knitted you in, the, in your mother's womb. And he says, I want you to be my prophet. So you can see that Elohim convinced, not convinced, but it's almost kind of encouraging. But he allowed him to make the choice. He didn't force him into it. And this is why I bring this up. Because in some of these translations, they will say, you have deceived me. Almost as if Jeremiah didn't have a choice. And it doesn't fit. To make the point, he says, you are stronger than I and I have prevailed. Uh, you're stronger than I and have prevailed. So his will... You see now the sovereignty of Yah and his will come over what Jeremiah would have preferred. I have been ridiculed all day long. Everyone mocks me. And it will be, it will be clear, like, as we see this wrestling between flesh and spirit, why Jeremiah would say that. For when I speak, I cry out, proclaiming violence and ruin. Because the word of Yah was made to me a reproach and a derision daily. He's saying that the word of Yah was a reproach to him. Why? Because of the amount of persecution he was getting. It wasn't all singing, all dancing, puppies and rainbows for Jeremiah. It was persecution. Whenever I said, let me not mention him, nor speak in his name again, it was in my heart like a burning fire shut up in my bones. And I became weary of holding back and was helpless. Jeremiah is telling you he wanted to throw the towel in. He says, no, I, I don't want to speak in his name again. Why? Because of what he was enduring. But he said it, that the word was in him. And you see this battle between flesh and spirit, I believe. His spirit man wanted to honor Elohim at any cost. But the flesh was struggling. Which is why he's saying in verse 7, you are stronger than I and you have prevailed, let your will be done. You like, so Jeremiah really struggled with his calling. Now think of Job and the struggle he was going through. For I heard many mocking, fear on every side, exposed they said, yes, let us expose him. All my friends watched for my stumbling saying, he might be lured away so that we prevail against him and take our revenge on him. This is why Jeremiah was that close to throwing the towel in. Didn't want to be a prophet anymore, but he was weary of holding back. Which means, for him to be weary of holding back, he'd actually said enough at one point and stopped. He says, I can't do this anymore. But it, it was burning inside of him. He had to. His spirit man was submitted to Elohim. Notice that it's okay to have the struggle. I really want to emphasize this. Generally, in the religious world, people will come down on you if you're struggling. You know, all kinds of struggles, like big questions. Whatever the struggle is, it's very clear that Elohim, it's not a sin to have the struggle. You, you, you see it with Job, or well, you're going to see it with Job. You're seeing it with Jeremiah. He genuinely wrestled, and in fact, he even said, enough. But then he came back to doing what he did. So the struggle is not the problem. In fact, we're told, look at um, Jacob. He had to wrestle. He had to contend with Elohim and man and overcome. But Yah is with me like a mighty awesome one. Therefore, my persecutors shall stumble and not prevail. They shall greatly be ashamed for they have not acted wisely. An everlasting reproach never to be forgotten. But, O Yar of hosts, now listen to what trying the righteous and seeing the kidneys on, in the heart. Let me see your vengeance on them, for I have revealed my cause to you. Jeremiah has done Matthew 18 with Elohim. He's struggled, he's contended, he's leaving vengeance to whom it belongs, to Elohim. But notice that in all of this, Jeremiah understands that he's not above reproof. 
Elohim trying the righteous. Remember that judgment had already been passed onto Judah. They're, they're going to face judgment. It's now Jeremiah that's in the balance, in the hands. And he says, trying the righteous, seeing my innermost being, you know, the, the kidneys and the heart, this is the innermost being, let me see your vengeance on them. Jeremiah is saying, I, I, I want you to do righteousness. Know that I'm doing this in righteousness. A bit like Job. Because Job knew he'd not, that he was physically righteous. And what I mean by that, his deeds. He hadn't persecuted anyone. He hadn't shortchanged anyone. He was righteous. Sing to Yah, praise Yah, for he has delivered the being of the poor from the hand of evil ones. Cursed be the day which I was born. Let not the day be blessed in which my mother bore me. Let the man be cursed who brought news to my father, saying, A male child has been born to you, making him very glad. And let that man be like the cities which Yah overthrew and repented not. Let him hear the cry in the morning and the shouting at noon. By the way, that's a reference to Sodom and Gomorrah. Because I was not slain from the womb, so that my mother should have seen my burial site and her womb forever great. Why did I come forth from the womb to see toil and sorrow and spend my days in shame? You've got to remember, it was an honor and shame culture back then. It was an honor and shame culture. So, Jared, like, we don't understand this generally from the West because we're generally shameless. Um, but... This is why Jeremiah is cursing the day, because he's getting nothing but trouble, nothing by, but persecution. So when we go to Job, again, it's got nothing to do with birthdays, okay? It's got everything to do with the flesh and the spirit wrestling as to why things are going the way they're going. Now, at least Jeremiah knew ahead of the curve that he would be persecuted. The problem is, is that his deliverance did not look ideal. He still had to go through being thrown in the pit, carted off to Egypt, all these things. Why? For now I would have been lying in peace. I would have slept and then I would have been at rest. That's why he wanted to be dead. Because he knew if he was dead, he was at rest. With sovereigns and counsellors of the earth who built ruins for themselves. So this idea of, um, this is, you know, kings would build like mausoleums and statues to themselves. That's what it's referring to. They build all these statues and buildings in honour of themselves, but they go to the grave and they become ruins. Or with rulers who had gold, who filled their houses with silver. Or as a hidden untimely birth, as infants who never saw the light. There the wrong cease raging and the weary are at rest. Notice this, this restful language. The prisoners rest together. They do not hear the voice of the oppressors. The small and the great and the servant is free from his master. Does this start to sound a bit like Ecclesiastes and Proverbs and... It does. In fact, we're going to go there. I want to quickly touch upon... Job, the wisdom, and Sheol a little bit, uh, like a brief overview. In Ecclesiastes 6, we get these same themes come up again in Ecclesiastes, that you, know, you, you work all your life and then you get to go to rest in Sheol. If a man brings forth a hundred children and lives many years, so like, this is speaking hyperbole, you wouldn't have a hundred children, so that the good days of his years are many, but his being is not satisfied with goodness. So there's this constant yearning, I need more, 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 more. Or indeed he has no burial place. I say that a premature birth is better than he. For it comes in futility. Now, the word there, Curtis has done a really great teaching on the book of Ecclesiastes. Uh, the word hevel in the Hebrew there, it means fleeting, temporary, it means vapor or smoke. This thing that is temporary. Futile has this negative connotation to it, which is not what Ecclesiastes is trying to say. It's speaking of the temporary nature of everything. So it comes, it comes and it goes away in darkness. It's temporary. In darkness, its name is covered. Even the sun it has not seen. It has more rest than that man. It's saying that a stillborn or a premature birth has more rest in Sheol 
than the man who's alive and he, he needs more and more and more. He's constantly, there's, it's not satiated, this thirst. And though he lives a thousand years, twice over, yet he shall not see goodness. Do not all go to one place. So first of all, let's notice, everyone goes to one place. Everyone, the good and the wicked. And we're going to see this. Ecclesiastes 9. For all this I took to heart, even to search out all of this, that the righteous and the wise and their deeds are in the hands of Elohim. No man knows whether love or hatred awaits for him. Now, was, remember what I said, that Job was actually before King David and Solomon, in fact, before the Torah was given. Which means that Ecclesiastes, if it's alluding to things of Job, it knows the wisdom of Job. Which is, this is King Solomon. Where do you think he's getting this from? Do, do you think he knows the story of Job? It is the same for all. One event to the righteous and to the wrong. To the good and to the clean, to the unclean, and to the one slaughtering or sacrificing, and to the one not slaughtering. As is the good one, so is the sinner. The one swearing as the one fearing an oath. This is an evil that is done under all the sun. Now, again, the Hebrew concept of evil, we think devil horns, evil, bad. In, he, in the Hebrew, the idea of evil means calamity. It can be hardship. It can be toil. Like, so we think of evil in, very, in a very polarized view. The Hebrew saw it as hardship, calamity. There is a calamity, an evil that is done under the sun. There is one event to all. Truly the hearts of the sons of men are filled with evil and madness is in their hearts while they live. And then to the dead. So everyone goes to, the, to, the, to death. But for him who is joined to all the living, there is trust. For a living dog is better than a dead lion. Now think of like the lion being this majestic creature, an apex predator. And remember that back then dogs was like a, it was a derogatory term. It was a derogatory term. So... A living dog is better than a dead lion. For the living know that they shall die, but the dead know not. They know nothing. Nor do they have any more reward, for their remembrance is forgotten. So there's no, the dead know nothing. Also their love and their hatred and their envy has now perished. So desire, emotion is not there in, the de at, in Sheol. The reason I bring this up is because of this whole thing of, are we conscious or not, right? You have to look at, can we agree that the Hebrew principles is precept upon precept? You have to build on the foundation and whatever is built on the top cannot contradict what has already come before it. This is some of the earliest writings in regards to Sheol. And it's telling you that the dead know nothing, love, hatred, envy, perish, so there's, it's implying no emotion. Go and eat your bread with joy and drink your wine with a glad heart, for Elohim has already approved your works. Let your garments be white at all times. Let your head lack no oil. So I believe this is saying be righteous. Let your garments be white. Act in righteousness at all times. Let your head lack no oil. I believe this thing of being spirit led. See life with the wife with whom you love. All the days of your temporary life. Your fleeting life. Which he has given to you under the sun. All your days of temporariness. You're, again, they're fleeting. For that, which, that is your share in life. And in your toil which you have laboured under the sun. All that your hand finds to do. Do it with your might. For there is no work or planning or knowledge or wisdom in Sheol where you are going. All go there. And Solomon, the wisest man, according to Elohim, says that there's none of this stuff going on in Sheol, in death. Which is implying, you're, again, you're at rest. Now remember that both the dead, uh, both the wicked and the good, all go to the same place. And if everyone's at rest... 
There's some more verses. Again, this is King David here. For in death there is no remembrance of you. Who give thanks to you in Sheol? So there's no praise, which is what we've just read. There's no remembrance, which means how do you remember something? You think. The dead do not praise Yah, nor any going down to silence. Again, it's a place of silence. But we, we bless Yah now and forever, praise Yah. Look at the, con- at the contrast being given here. Peace, silence, we praise. That's the contrast being given. Let me not die, but live and declare the works of Yah. Yah has punished me severely, but do not give me over to death. Why? So that he can declare the works of Yah. Which means there's no declaration going on in Sheol. There's no praise. Again, like this is the foundation. This is the foundation biblically of what Sheol is. So anything that comes after has to fit within that, those parameters. Okay. Now I'm not going to do a whole teaching on Sheol, but th- this is your basic principle. Everything that then comes after has to fit with that foundation. There is a futility, something temporary, something fleeting, which has been done on the earth. That there are righteous ones who get according to the deeds of the wrong. So I've, look at Job. This is, ex- this is actually the accusation he brings against Elohim. I've been righteous, why am I suffering? And there are wrong ones who get according to the deeds of the righteous. I said that this too is temporary. Thank goodness, right? Therefore I praised enjoyment because there is no good to man except to eat and to drink and to rejoice. And it remains with him in his labor for the days of his life which Elohim has given him under the sun. Now I'm I'm going through all this in Ecclesiastes because it's like that. Once all the hardship and toil came to Job, and it's, it's hardship and toil that none of us have experienced, let's be honest, but it's like he forgot everything that came before. And Ecclesiastes is saying, you know, enjoy things while you can, because you never know when you're, you're, the tides may turn, is essentially what he's saying. When I gave my heart to know wisdom and see the task which has been done on earth, even though one sees no sleep day or night, Then I saw all the work of Elohim, that man is unable to find out the work that which has been done under the sun. And I believe this is why Job struggled. He was searching, yeah, why is this occurring to me? Because look, Job says that we don't know what Elohim does in the background. You know, he, he binds the stars. He actually says that. And then Yah reminds him of that. He says all these things that, you know, the greatness of Elohim, that man cannot fully understand him. And Solomon's saying here that you can't search it out, which means that don't be surprised if you don't understand what's going on. For, through, for though a man labors to seek, yet he does not find it. And even though a wise one claims to know, he is unable to find it. And that's the place that Job found himself in. He was seeking and he was saying, we'll read this later on, but he says, I'm calling out to you and you're not answering to me. Why? Why are you being silent to me? So do we understand where we're at? Job is cursing the day. Why? Because of the toil. He wants to be at peace. That's what he wants. He wants to be at peace. Why does he give light to the sufferer and life to the bitter of being? Who are waiting for death, but it does not come and search for it more than treasures. Now, Solomon will say that you need to seek for wisdom more than treasures. So you get this interesting parallel here. Who rejoice exceedingly. They are glad when they find the burial site. Why does he give light to a man who has been hidden and whom Eloah has hedged in? For my sighing comes before I eat and my groanings pour out like water. For that which I greatly feared has come upon me. And that which I have dreaded has overtaken me. Now I believe you're being, you're be, we're being shown something that was in Job's heart. And I believe it's a lack of integrity. Because if you've truly given yourself into the hands of Elohim... It doesn't matter what comes to you. 
What did David say? Though 10,000 fall by one side and a thousand by the other, yet I will praise his name. What did Job say earlier? Yah gives, Yah takes away, yet Yah will be praised. But he still feared. He hadn't, which means he's still holding on to an ounce of self. He's holding on to something in his heart. Does that make sense? I have not been at ease, nor have I been undisturbed, nor at rest, yet trouble comes. I made a statement last week that I believe that what Job was going through was to take him to the level of bride. Okay? Why do I say that? Verse 25, Job greatly feared something. That which he had dreaded had overtaken me. We're going to look at some stuff in, in the Brit, in the New Testament. Hebrews 10.31, it is a fearsome to fall into the hands of the living Elohim. But remember the former days when after you were enlightened, you endured a great struggle with suffering. So it's talking of persecution. The, the believers were being persecuted. On one hand, you were exposed to reproaches and pressures. And on the other hand, you became sharers with those who were so treated. Because remember, they saw persecution uh, as, not as a good thing in the flesh, but spiritually as a good thing because it refined them. For you sympathize with me in my chains and you accepted with joy the seizure of your possessions, knowing that you have a better and lasting possession for yourselves in the heavens. They were eternally minded. Now Job, we know knew of the resurrection. We'll get this to this later. I know that my redeemer lives, he says. I know that I will be, he basically says he knows there's a resurrection. But if he knew that, why doesn't he have this mindset? Do you see the point I'm making? He would, he, fair enough, woe is me. He had every right to be. He'd lost everything. But he was not seeing it as something to have a better and lasting possession in the heavens. He was not seeing it as a chance of being refined. He was stuck in this place of woe. Do not then lose your boldness, which has great reward. Now elsewhere it says, come boldly before the throne. Job was petrified of coming before Elohim. For you have need of endurance, so that when you have done the desire of Elohim, you receive the promise. For yet a little while, he who is coming shall come and shall not delay. But the righteous shall live by faith, by belief. But if anyone draws back, my being has no pleasure in him. I've highlighted this because it's clear that Elohim wanted Job to go through the sifting. And Job is saying, no, I want to die now, which is essentially to go back to how he was, do you know what I mean? He was before being alive. It is, he's not going the way Yah wanted him to go, which means that at best he's standing still. At worst, he's starting to draw back. Do you see where I'm kind of, why I say that Job's issues are so subtle? They're very, very subtle and they're really, they're heart level stuff. But these are the things that have a massive impact in our faith. Now, I'm not saying Job was drawing back like rebelling, but he was not moving forward. Like he just wanted to die. Elohim wanted him to go through. There's a, there's a difference here. But we are not of those who draw back to destruction, but of belief or faith to the preservation of life. Remember that faith, it has this idea of trust within it as well, is one of the components of it. Is Job showing faith in wanting to die rather than go through the trial? No, but do you see how subtle it is? I can, look, we have to empathize for Job. We really do. We really have to empathize. And let's remember, Yah said he was righteous indeed, with his deeds, with his lips, but it's just something, again, that fallen nature. 1 John 4, verse 16, we have known and believed that the love El Elohim has for us. Elohim is love. As we read through Job, we're going to see that Job did not feel like Elohim was love. In fact, he says, you have become like an enemy to me because of the persecution you're allowing to come upon me. 
He who stays in love stays in Elohim and Elohim in him. By this love has been perfected in us, with us in order that we might have boldness in the day of judgment. Because as he is, so we are in this world. Job was not bold about his judgment day. In fact, he was petrified of it, which means that love had not been perfected in him. He was righteous, indeed. Didn't sin with his lips, but love hadn't been perfected. And I believe this is what, notice as well that this is in the, con, um, in Hebrews, this is in the context of persecution, hardship, toil. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out all fear, because fear holds punishment. And he who fears has not been made perfect in love. Job knew that if he was to stand before Elohim, he would be reproved. He was fearing punishment. John is telling you that Job, at that particular stage, his love had not been perfected. Does everyone get that? Cool. Job 4. Eliphaz the Temanite, this is his first friend, answered and said, If one tries a word with you, would you become impatient? But who is able to withhold himself from speaking? See, you have instructed many, and you have made weak hands strong. So now Eliphaz is confirming that Job was actually a teacher of some kind, someone who was a judge. Your words have raised, him, raised up him who was stumbling, and you have strengthened weak knees, which means Job understood righteousness. But now it has come to you, and you are impatient. It strikes you, and you are troubled. Is Eliphaz lying? No. He, he's, he's right there in that statement. And what we're going to see with Job's three friends, they say a lot of good things and then their own words catch them out. And we're going to see a lot of self-righteousness and also condemnation coming from them. Is not your reverence, your fear, your trust and the integrity of your ways, your expectancy, your hope? Remember, please, who being innocent has ever perished and where have the straight ones ever been cut off? What is Eliphaz saying to Job? Yeah, you've done something wrong. You're not righteous. Who being innocent has ever perished? Who, where are straight ones ever been cut off? Look at where Job is. Look, look at what he says. Is not your fear, your reverence, your trust, the integrity of your ways, your hope, your expectancy? He's saying that Job is disingenuous. He's essentially calling him a whitewashed tomb. He's saying he's not innocent, and he's saying he's not straight. Now, Job says Job is righteous. He says to Hasatan, there is none righteous like him in all the land. Hmm. According to what I have seen, those who plow wickedness and sow, rough, sow suffering reap the same. So he's saying to Job, you, you must have been plowing wickedness somewhere. And you've been doing it in the background because we don't know about it. Nice, isn't it? I believe Eliphaz has a, those who keep Torah a safe man, mindset. While that's a true statement, what I mean by that, and this was rife in Adventism where I grew up in. If bad stuff happened to you, you oh, you must have sinned. You must have sinned. You, there must be sin inside or else this wouldn't happen to you. That's the kind of mindset. And you see this a lot in the Torah movement. I also see people genuinely struggling saying, well, I'm, going, I'm trying my best to keep the covenant, yet why am I still suffering? Come in at it more from the despair side of things rather than the condemning. Turns out, our king's disciples had the same mindset. In John 9, passing by, he, Yeshua, saw a man blind from birth, and his taught ones asked him, saying, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he should be born blind? It's that same mindset. You must have done something wrong, because something bad's happened to you. Yeshua answered, neither this man nor his parents sinned, but that the works of Elohim might be made manifest in him. Now, why was Job going through what he went through? That the works of Elohim might be made manifest in him. What is that work, by the way? Faith. Faith I believe it's the work of the heart. No man can change a man's heart. 
Only he can change the heart of man. That's the work of Elohim. So, going back to Job, he's not done nothing wrong. In fact, it was Elohim who handed Job over to Satan, wasn't it? So who is Eliphaz now blaspheming? He's blaspheming Yah. He's saying, well, you must have done something wicked. Yah's punishing you. It was Yah that said, look at righteous Job. You know what? Have a go. It's completely upside down. So we've got to, the reason I bring this up, we've got to be very careful when people are going through things. Because we read the curses of Deuteronomy and then we see someone go through something and we go, oh, they must be a sinner. Shame on you if that's what you're, the first place you go to. Again, look at Job. And unto me a word was secretly brought, and my ear received a little of it. Amid thoughts from visions of the night, when deep sleep falls on men, fear came upon me and trembling, causing my bones to shake greatly. Then a spirit passed before my face, the hair on my body stood up. It stood still, but I could not discern its appearance. A form was before my eyes, silence, and then a voice I heard, is mortal man more righteous than Eloah or God? Is man more clean than his maker? Now, what are we told to do with the spirits? To test them, okay, to test them. So, I mean, it's all well and good that Eliphaz saw this and he had this revelation, but if you look at verse 17, it's like, it's not like a groundbreaking revelation. It's like, well, yeah, obviously. Do you, do you see what I mean? Like, if you read the scriptures, you can see that very clearly. Look, he puts no trust in his servants and he charges his messengers with straying. Did he charge the messengers for straying? Yes. Does he put his trust in his servants? He does. Who's mis misrepresenting Yah? Eliphaz is. I'm, in fact, we'll go, I've got some scriptures to show that in a bit. How much more those who dwell in the houses of clay, whose foundations is in the dust, who are crushed like a moth? From morning till evening they are beaten down, they perish forever with no one regarding. Are not the cords of their tents pulled up? They die without wisdom. So Eliphaz is saying two things here. That Yah doesn't trust his servants that Job's a sinner, and that the, these men, in general, they die without wisdom. And I believe that Eliphaz is misrepresenting Elohim here, big time. Let's look at this idea, does Elohim trust? Numbers, this is Yah telling off uh, Miriam and uh, Aaron for coming against Moses. He said, hear now my words, if your prophet is of Yah, I make myself known to him in a vision, and I speak to him in a dream. Not so with my servant Moses. He is trustworthy in all my house. Yah trusted Moshe. So much so that he was, he's part of the Torah, right? I speak with him mouth to mouth and plainly, and not in riddles. And he sees the form of Yah, so why were you not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? Moses, first witness, is trustworthy. 1 Samuel 2, verse 34. This is the, uh, the prophecy coming against Eli, uh, the, the high priest in Samuel's day. This is, the sign that, this is the sign that comes to you, to your two sons, upon Hophni and Pinchas. In one day they are going to die, both of them. We know that his two sons were unrighteous and they'd steal from the offerings and stuff. And I shall raise up for myself a trustworthy priest who does according to what is in my heart and in my being. So Yah is prophesying, I will have a trustworthy high priest. Nehemiah, this is Nehemiah praying to Elohim. You are Yah, the Elohim who chose Avraham, so Abraham, and brought him out of Ur of the Chaldees, and you gave him the name of Avraham, and found his heart trustworthy before you. So now we've got three people that Yah trusts. I could stop here, let me give you two more witnesses. Yeshua in the parable, who then is a trustworthy and wise servant, whom his master shall set over his household to give them food in due season. 
Blessed is that servant whom his master having come shall find so do it. So there's going to be some people that are trustworthy, wise servants. What was uh, Eliphaz saying? That Yah doesn't trust his servants and that man will die without wisdom. This is in stark contrast. This is why when in the book of Job, when Elohim shows up on the scene, he says, who are these that are uh, bending wisdom? Matthew 25, 21, parable of the uh, talents. His master said to him, well done, good and trustworthy servant. You were trustworthy over a little. I shall set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. Those who follow him, who follow Messiah, are chosen and trustworthy. So Eliphaz is misrepresenting Elohim. Okay, yes, he's, you, again, like I said, you're going to see with Joe's three friends, they say some truth and then they say some other stuff, right? That doesn't add up. Let's look at what, let's continue. Call out, please. Is there, so this is Eliphaz speaking to Job. Call out, please. Is there anyone to answer you? And to which of the set apart ones would you turn? Now, remember that he's just accused Job of being unrighteous. You, some, you must have done something. So who's going to listen to you? Right? Bear that in the back of your mind. For wrath kills the fool and envy slays the simple. I myself have seen the fool taking root, but suddenly his home was cursed. He's essentially saying, Job, you're a fool. What what's just happened to Job? He's lost the house, he's lost the cattle, he's lost everything, gone. The children, his sons are far from safety. They are crushed in the gate with no one to deliver. What happened to Job's children? The house fell down on them. Do you see what Eliphaz, he's been cutting, cutting. Never mind that he's suffering. Like, this is the ironic thing, like his three friends, they come and they sit there for seven days, you know, because the pain is great, and then they just start laying into him. It's like they were wait. you know when you're talking to someone and they're just waiting to talk back at you? Like they're not listening to you, but they just want to say, you know. The hungry eats up his harvest, taking it even from the thorns, and the snare snaps up their wealth. Like, and this is speaking of the fool. And this is what Eliphaz is saying. Job, you're a fool, mate. You must be. Like, we don't know about it, but you must be. Something's going on in the background, and which is why I believe Eliphaz, at the start of his speech, was attacking Job's integrity. For evil does not come from the dust, nor does trouble spring up from the ground. Essentially, it's saying there's no uh, cause and effect this evil that's come upon you it must have come from somewhere it didn't just uh, appear that's the way we would say it you must have done something wrong for man is born for trouble and the sparks fly upward but as for me I would seek El and I would submit my case to Elohim right again he's caught himself by his words what's the issue here It's in stark contrast to what he said in verse 1. Call out, please. Is there anyone to answer you? And to which of the set-apart ones would you turn? He's saying out of one side of his mouth, no one will listen to you, of the set-apart ones. But then he's saying, well, if it was me, I would seek out. Like, you can't go both ways. Which is it, Eliphaz? Which is it? Now, if you see... Again, remember that the mouth speaks from the overflow of the heart, which means there's, uh, there's some hypocrisy and double-mindedness in Eliphaz's heart for, the, for him to be speaking out of both sides of his mouth. Who is doing great and unsearchable deeds, innumerable wonders. Well, that's true. Thwarting the schemes of the crafty so that their hands do not work effectively. If I'm not mistaken... That word for crafty is the same word used uh, for the serpent, ahum. And in fact, later on, I, I think it's later on in the series, but we'll see that um, essentially one of Job's friends accuses Job of speaking like a serpent. <laughs> Catching the wise in their own craftiness and the counsel of schemers are swept away. Eliphaz is saying, Job, you must be a schemer. You must have schemed all this, but now that your counsel, it's all being swept away. 
By day they encounter darkness, and at noon they grope as in the night. Look, blessed is the man whom Eloah does reprove. So do not despise the discipline of the Almighty. Do you see, like, he's just kind of, he's, his speaking is being tossed by every, like, it's just not straight. It's like, I'm over here one bit, I'm over here the next. Like, who will listen to you, but you need to make an account with Elohim. Blessed is the man whom Eloah does reprove, so don't reprove his discipline, but he's saying, blessed is the man who endures discipline, but you must be cursed because you've done something wrong. It's just not congruent. For he bruises, but he binds up. He smites, but his hands heal. In six distresses, he delivers you, and in seven, no evil strikes you. And you shall know that your tent is in peace and shall visit your tent and not sin. And shall know that your seed are many and your offspring like the grass of the earth. Do you see, like, he, he, when you understand how cutting he's been to Job right here. You shall come to the burial site in ripe old age, like the stacking of grain in its season. Look, this we have searched out. It is so. Hear it and know for yourself. And what I find interesting is that Eliphaz is awfully sure of himself in regards to one's future. He, he's, he's very dogmatic on this. Now, yes, there is blessings and for, for wisdom and blessings of obedience. But again, look at the story of Job. We just don't know why someone may be going through something. It, it, to say, well, you must have done something wrong is actually coming from self-righteousness. And condemnation, you're sat in the judgment seat that you're not worthy to sit in. Let's look at Job's reply and then we'll finish for today. Job answered and said, Oh, that my grief were thoroughly weighed and my calamity be placed on the scales, for it would outweigh the sand of the sea, therefore my words have been rash. Job is being open that he's speaking rashly. Okay, so he's coming clean. Now, this is really interesting because he said earlier that Job did not sin with his lips. But here he's saying, look, I'm being rash. I get it. Okay, I'm not saying he was sinning with his lips. But you know, sometimes you can say things in a way that are very blunt, shall we say. For the arrows of the Almighty are within me. My spirit drinks in their poison. The onslaughts of Eloah are arrayed against me. Oh, that I might have my desire that Eloah would grant me what I long for, that it would please Eloah to crush me, lose his hand and cut me off. He's saying, I, I want Elohim to, to kill me, is what he's saying. That's what he desires. Then I would have, still have comfort. Why? Because it'd be in Sheol. And I would rejoice in pain, though not spared, for I have not hidden the words of the set-apart one. What strength do I have that I should wait? And what is my end that I should prolong my life? Now, here's the thing. We know the end of Job's story, don't we? He doesn't. Job is actually being protected from himself by the Almighty, and he doesn't even know it. Again, like, we just don't know. Like, we see through a glass dimly. We're told that uh, Yah's word is like a lamp unto our feet. Now, back then, a lamp only illuminated, like, the immediate area in front of you. It, you couldn't see very far. We, th th this is what we are. And Elohim sits above it all, knowing the end from the beginning. Job's been, like... I th you know when I say, like, uh, Yah does things in spite of us. This is what I'm talking about. The amount of times that he must be protecting us and doing things in spite of us, and we're just not aware, and probably never will be. To him who is afflicted should be shown loving commitment, even the one leaving the fear of the Almighty. I believe he's, he's reproving his friend here because Job is going through suffering and he's saying you should be showing me loving commitment, not coming at me with your self-righteousness. He says even the one leaving the fear of the Almighty, like someone that's, being quest like that's questioning their faith, he says show them loving commitment, don't come in self-righteousness. Job's reproving Eliphaz here. Now what's interesting 
uh, in the Syriac version and the Vulgate. So the Syriac is the Aramaic versions, um, not the Aramaic, it's the Syriac. I'm trying to think, you, you know you've got the, the Peshitta version of the New Testament, that's the Syriac version. So there's Syriac copies. This verse reads differently in other manuscripts. It says, the one who withholds loyal love, so loving commitment, from a friend forsakes the fear of the Almighty. Saying that if you're, if you're going to withhold this lo loving commitment from a friend, you've forgotten what the faith is. I believe whichever rendering you go, those are both true statements and both those statements are, is Job reproving his friend. This is why James would say, right, this is, this is undefiled religion, to feed the poor, to feed the, the orphans and all that. My brothers, so remember, this is speaking of his three friends now. They're as undependable as a wadi, as a bed on which streams once ran, which are dark because of the ice in which the snow is hidden. When it is warm, they cease to flow. When it is hot, they vanish from their place. The paths of their way turn aside. They enter wastes and perish. Passengers of Tamar look expectantly. Travelers of Shavar waited for them. And speaking of the waters going through this, he's painting a poetic picture here. They were ashamed because they had trusted they came there and they were disappointed. So they, in the picture he's painting, these people come for the waters and the waters don't come as they're supposed to. Indeed, you have now become the same. He's saying to his friends, you, this is what you're doing. You're being undependable. You're meant to come to me and help me through this rather than come at me in self-righteousness. You see my downfall and are afraid, which is really interesting. Do you think that Job, th this is me going out on a limb here, but Job knew he was righteous. Everybody around would have known Job was righteous, and okay, that may have come into question when Job goes through his trials, but do you think that, this is what I mean about the fallen nature, were his friends subconsciously thinking, if this is what happens to the righteous, whoa, I'm in trouble. Do you see what I mean? And this happening at an unconscious level. So what, does the, what do you do? You put yourself more righteous than the person. So now you're in the clear mentally. You see my downfall and are afraid. What's interesting here, it says the Septuagint in the Syriac. So where it says you have become the same, it says um, you have also come to me without pity. You see my downfall and are afraid. So again, uh, either way you want to render it, Job is reproving his friends. He's reproving them, and pretty harshly too. Did I ever say, give to me or offer a bribe for, for me from your wealth? So he's saying, look, you guys know I'm righteous. Why are you saying I'm wicked? Or rescue me from the hand of the enemy or redeem me from the hand of oppressors. He says, you should know me by now. You should know me. Don't you believe me? So now you see Job actually feeling betrayed by his friends. What does it feel like when you think someone that's trusted in your circle and then they start believing things about you that are not true? Would that really hit hard? So not only is Job gone through what he's gone through, his, now, his friends, he's now seeing his friends for what they really are. Talk about adding more onto the burden. Teach me and I shall be silent and show me where I've gone astray. So Job's saying, look, tell me. Actually give me some concrete proof. Because one thing you will see is that his friends just give him ideals. They say, well, we know that it's only the wicked that perish. We know that it's only the oppressor that bad things happen to. And Job is saying, actually give me some evidence here. Rather than giving me your broad maxims. Because you're going to see later on that Job says, I know this stuff too, don't you know? Words of uprightness are harsh, but what does your reproving reprove? Because we're told, there is a verse, you know, you shall love your neighbour as yourself and you shall certainly reprove him. But when you reprove someone, do you, 
Do you actually say, well, brother, I think this is where you may be going wrong? You actually give, you, you give a behavior or, or, or an act that's happened. You point to something and you say, brother, I don't think that was right. Job's friends are not doing that. They're saying, well, you must have done something in the background because only the sinners get persecuted. They're not coming with evidence. Do you reckon to reprove my words and the sayings of one in despair, which are as wind? He's saying, why are you reproving me? I, I, I'm already being judged. I don't need more judgment from you. Show me loving commitment. You would cast lots over the fatherless and make merchandise of your friend. <laughs> Job can cut back too. But now, please look at me whether I would lie to your face. Relent, please. Let there be no unrighteousness. Relent. My righteousness is still in it. He's saying, like, I believe Job was feeling betrayed here. The people that were meant to be helping him, that should have known him, turned against him. Is there any unrighteousness on my tongue? Does, does my taste not discern what is perverse? So um, this is actually a Hebrew idiom, uh, being able to know the difference between right and wrong. So the, the, they used this idea of tasting to discern. He says, I know what is perverse. I know right and wrong. If I'd have done something wrong, I wouldn't be complaining like I am, is essentially what he's saying. When I say my bed does comfort me, my couch does ease my, does ease my complaint, then you frighten me with dreams and make me afraid with visions. You see him again holding his friend to account. He's like, why are you trying to petrify me? Like there's a way of going about things. He's, he's essentially saying, I don't need your vision to make me scared. I already know I'm in the hands of Elohim. I already know that Elohim has allowed this to happen to me. I just don't know why. And you're coming in here with self-righteousness accusations and your dreams and visions as to why I'm now personally, like why I'm wrong. <laughs> I kind of feel sorry for him. So that my being chooses strangling death rather than my bones. I've wasted away, I would not live forever. Leave me alone for my days are as a breath. He's literally saying, like, I, Job probably thinks he's not got long left. And he's like, just give me peace and quiet for my, my last days. Eliphaz is using his dreams and visions and self-righteousness and isn't helping Job one bit. Why did he even share that? He used his his vision, that spirit that he saw, to accuse Job. He says, because what, what did Eliphaz see in this vision or whatever it was? He said that this spirit says, no man is right before Elohim. And he's using that as, uh, to, as part of the crux of his argument. Well, you must have done something wrong. You must have. I, I heard it in a dream and vision. This is now Job turning to Elohim. You'll see, you, remember what I said in the literary structure, you see a friend answer Job and then Job answers his friend and then it goes, when you look at Job's answers, he speaks to his friend first and then he speaks to Elohim. And it does that every time Job responds. So this is now Job speaking to Elohim. What is man that you should make him great, that you should set your heart on him? That you should visit him every morning, trying him every moment. So again, this thing of being, you're always on the testing ground. How long do you not look away from me, nor leave me alone till I swallow my saliva? Have I sinned? What have I done to you, O watcher of men? Why have you set me as your target so that I am a burden to you? And why do you not pardon my transgression and take away my crookedness? For now I lie in the dust and you shall seek me, but I am not. What's Job doing here with Elohim? Matthew 18. He's bringing his offense to Elohim. What does Elohim say to his people? Come, reason. Let, let us reason. Let us reason. We'll get this later on. Job is doing Matthew 18 with Elohim. He's bringing his offense. I don't know what I've done. 
Why are you being silent to me? Why have you set me as your target? If I've done something wrong, we're going to read next week. He's saying, if I've done something wrong, why don't you tell me? Who's had that feeling before with Elohim? Yeah, I know that one. He, he, who here has found that Elohim will say, by the way, there's something in the house. And it's like, thank you. Are you going to tell me what it is? And he's like, no, you're going to find out in the journey. I'm like, gee, thanks. <laughs> and in my impatience, it's like, tell me what it is, Father. Tell me what it is. And he says, no, you're going on a journey. There's something about figuring it out yourself. And well, I say figuring it out, but being led and coming to the realization, it's a lot more powerful. But Job is doing Matthew 18 with Elohim. And this is, again, remember what I said, the struggle is not the crime. In fact, if you're actually struggling with Elohim, take it to him, because this is what Job is doing. And remember what Yah said about Job. He, he, he names him alongside Daniel and Noah as one of the, th you know, these three righteous men. Job's doing Matthew 18, and he's not pulling punches back either. We're going to read, like, in the next part. Job really says, like, Father, what's going on? Like, I cry out, you've blocked me out. And he, he's essentially saying, that's how I feel. Let's stop here for today. You've probably noticed we're not taking every single verse. I'm just trying to pull out the main points. There's lots of poetry and, you know... 15 verses to make one point, you know, lots of, uh, you know, flowery talk, shall we say. But so far, I hope we can start to see where there's a, Job's heart is not in, uh, in unity. There's, he says one thing, but then he kind of says another. Uh, Job's friend definitely accusing him, not knowing why Elohim is doing it and actually bearing false witness of Elohim. As we move into the next part, we're going to see this more and more, actually. And the more we go through, the more we're going to see the issues of the heart really start coming to the surface. Um, but in conclusion, do not think you know why someone is going through something. You have no idea. No idea. And to then bring your accusation as to why... You will actually incur judgment from Elohim. Where Yah had said to Job, you need to intercede for your friends. Anyway, let's stop here. Amen.